I'd like to welcome everyone to Software Spotlight, your front row seat to the latest innovations in software for small business. I'm Michael Burnswag, your host, and each week we're joined by executives at leading software companies to get an insider's perspective on the emerging technologies, business strategies, and market trends shaping the future. Tune in to stay ahead of the curve on leveraging software to boost productivity and growth in your business. Be sure to visit our website, softwareoasis.com, to access our free weekly newsletter and sign up for our upcoming 2024 software webinar series. Today, we're joined by Jason Bernard. He's known online as the branded SERP guy, and he comes to us with a wealth of knowledge on SEO. He joins the podcast to share his experience in digital brand management and controlling your brand narrative in search results. As the founder of Calicube, Jason has over 20 years of experience helping companies optimize their online presence. We'll dive into Jason's insights on Google's knowledge graph to build brand authority in search. He hosts the podcast, Branded Search and Beyond. And with that, I'm going to welcome you to the show, Jason. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, one very small correction. It's now more than 25 years, a quarter oh, of a century. Fantastic. I started in the year Google was um, incorporated. They incorporated in September. I launched my first website in December. So Google and I have grown up together for 25 years. 26, That's fantastic. Now. And I, I think the, the last time we were speaking, I, I mentioned that Software Oasis started in the same month, September of 1998. So definitely uh, an interesting uh, detail there. but. I think I'd be remiss if I did not ask you to uh, give give our our listeners a quick little uh, little uh, song to uh, to open up our episode. I know I know our our listeners that that have been listening to your branded search podcast here. You open up all the time with song. I do indeed. A quick hello and we're good to go. Welcome to the show, the audience and my co. I love it. That's fantastic. I'll, and I see your, your guitar in the background. So obviously the musical background is part of yeah. the fabric of, of, uh, of Jason. So that's, uh, that's uh, excellent. So I was hoping you could give us maybe just a, a brief overview of what brought you to where you are in terms of um, your journey towards uh, launching Calicube. Right, well, lovely question. Um, I've had quite a rich and varied life. Uh, I have a degree in economics and statistical analysis from Liverpool John Moores University. I was then a professional musician for 10 years. Then I was a professional uh, filmmaker and uh, web developer and songwriter and voice actor and screenwriter for the Buwan Kuala series. So music all the way through, cartoons, sure. uh, script writing, general creativity. And that means that I am the perfect example of somebody who needs to manage their personal brand because it's so rich. And I've got so many different facets to my life and my uh, personal brand. And the trick, and this is how I got into managing personal brands, is that I needed to get Google to focus on my current work, which is digital marketer, managing brands in, in search and indeed across the internet, rather than focusing on my musical career and my filmmaking career. So what I learned was I can change Google's focus. I can move it away from something like music, which has been a huge part of my life, and towards digital marketing, helping CEOs and founders of companies, especially startups, manage their personal brand and indeed their company's digital marketing strategy. Changing so, the focus of Google, Google is what I do. Yeah, so it sounds like really molding um, your online vision, identity, corporate structure, kind of where you're heading as, yeah. as an entity is part of um, getting getting things where you want them to be within the Google knowledge yeah. graph. And, and, um, and that's a good point. You say the word entity and the focus is let's get Google to understand who you are. Then we can get it to understand what you do, who you serve and that you are an authority within your field. 
And that's a, a four-step process that really brings to the fore, as you'll immediately imagine for a person, that growth in their personal brand, the amplification of their personal brand, pushing them to the fore. If Google thinks you're a superstar in your field, then you probably are. Interesting. And let me ask you a question at a, at a high level, because I know we could geek out on this uh, during the whole podcast, but obviously the the big um, you know buzz online is EEAT. And yep. at the end of the day, which came first? Was knowledge, the, the whole concept of, of knowledge graph and everything that was going on there um, kind of like right. a predecessor to that? Or is it all wrapped up into one? Or can you kind of That's a peel, peel, a peel that back for us? No, it's a lovely question. Very onion-esque, as you said, peel back the layers. Um, the knowledge graph came first. Now, if you look back historically, Google used links as a measure of credibility. But links are actually just a measure of popularity. So it's obviously a very bad measure, but it was better than everybody else had back in 1998. And that's what changed the game in Google's favor. They can only apply links to a web page or a website. Once they understand who the website owner is and who the author is, the content creator, they call it, then they can start applying other signals than links. For example, awards, qualifications, customer reviews, peer group approval on social media, other articles written. All of that can only come together with EEAT expertise, experience, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness if it understands who you are, who the content creator is, and who the website owner is. So EEAT is the measure of credibility that is replacing links because links can only be applied to websites and web pages, whereas EEAT can be applied to website owners and content creators. That's a huge leap for Google. Got it. Very interesting. And maybe maybe we could start off for our listeners uh, who may be executives at different uh, organizations or developers trying to figure this out. Um, maybe we could start off with just a, a real basic definition of, of the knowledge graph to, to give people a, a clear understanding. The simplest way to look at the knowledge graph is it's an encyclopedia for machines. So it's uh, like Wikipedia, but significantly bigger. And I, I'll explain in a moment just quite how much bigger it is. It's a way for machines to understand the world like a human would with a huge encyclopedia that can, it, it can refer to for the facts about things, people, companies, places, uh, records, music albums, music groups, films, actors, anything that you can identify. In fact, indeed, topics too, such as economics. So it understands sure. economics in an encyclopedic manner in the knowledge graph. It understands that Jason Barnard is specialized in digital marketing and has a degree in the topic of economics in its massive machine encyclopedia. And to give you an idea of the size, Wikipedia has 6 million articles. So it's got articles about 6 million things. The knowledge graph currently at Google has 50 billion articles, entities and 1,500 billion facts. And at that kind of scale, for us as human beings, we can't really get a grasp on it anymore. Yeah, that, that's mind blowing. So, and at a high level, do you think this was Google's answer to the exponential growth of content on the internet, needing to find a way to understand and relate what's, what's going on on the internet without physically having to index every single piece of content on the internet or uh, somewhere in between? or Yeah, well, that's where they're going, is to index less and less. I've got a friend called Gennaro Cofano um, who explains this incredibly well. But putting that aside, the knowledge graph isn't the reason that they're indexing less. The knowledge graph is that Google have always wanted to understand, but they didn't have the means and the technology uh, to be able to do it. So counting words in pages, I mean, if we look back, sorry, I'll start that sentence again. If we look back, Google have always been a word counting and a link counting machine. And they understand the world by word counting, and they, uh, they understand credibility by link counting. Today, they understand the world using the knowledge graph, at least partially. And they understand credibility using EEAT signals applied to the entities that they've understood in the knowledge graph. So it's actually a transition to a significantly more robust system 
for judging who can solve which problems for whom and how credible each of those solution providers are. Because at the end of the day, all Google wants to do is bring the solution provider and the solution seeker together, and it wants the best possible solution for its users. So if you can become understood and prove to Google, sorry, let's start that again. If you can become understood as an entity, you can explain to Google what you do, and by extension, who you serve, then you can convince it you're the most credible solution. And at that point, as a recommendation, Google, Google is obsessed by recommending the best solution to the problem its users have. Google will recommend you and not your competitors. It makes a lot of sense. And, and I'm right there with you. Obviously, the quality of the, the results um, are you know, the key or the foundational layer to what Google is all about. I mean, they want to, as you mentioned, they want to deliver the best possible result and finish the search so that the individual does not have to search further and uh, can, mm. can go on with their day because they know they've found the answer. So that that's really interesting. So can you explain for us, you know, obviously you've had a, an interesting journey up until this point. Um, you know, you've had, you know, your background in the music industry with launching your WTPL. Um, that was in the, the early early to late 90s. And, uh, you know, you also overlap that with your, your other experience at up to 10. Uh, but I was hoping, can you give us a little bit of background on what Calicu does at this point for uh, companies and what some of the offerings look like? How How is it that the Knowledge Graph integrates with, with what you're doing? Yeah, well, Calicube's my third company. I'm an entrepreneur despite myself, and I created companies to be able to commercially frame what it was I was doing, initially music, then cartoons for kids, and now helping CEOs and founders with their personal brand, their reputation, um, growing their personal brand, but also helping them and their companies with their presence in search on Google. So it's any brand. We can manage the presence and the representation of any brand in search. And the really cool trick is that that's the surface. That's what people see. How do people perceive you through the eyes of the search engine? But in order to control what the search engines represent you as, we need to get them to understand who you are, understand who you serve, and understand that you're the best. And that, as you will guess, because they're crawling the internet, as you said, we need to prove on every single touch point with your audience that you are talking to the right audience, presenting the right solutions to that audience at the right time, in the right places, and that you're serving them incredibly well. So we use the idea that Google is watching you every single second of every single day, everything you publish, as a way for us to help you to build your digital ecosystem, grow your personal brand, or grow your brand or your marketing strategy for your company. Because we know that Google is showing us, A, what you need to do, which is what CaliQ Pro, we built a machine called CaliQ Pro that analyzes Google to understand what needs to be done. Then we do it, and then the CaliQ Pro will measure how well Google has received that information, how well we're doing. So it's a, a window into what needs to be done and a KPI for, are we doing a good job? So, so you have not only the, the knowledge graph, but you have the tool, the proprietary tool that you've developed to be able to understand what it is that Google understands about your entity. Yeah. And if you, if you look at how Google understands you, you can immediately see the gaps in its understanding. So the first sure. thing is to fill in the gaps. Fill in the gaps. Make sure it's understood. Yeah. Yep. And then say, well, it's understood this much. Now we can expand its knowledge to significantly more information yeah. about you. We can build its, un its, its confidence in that understanding. Then we can build its understanding of your topic. Then we can prove by A plus B that you're the most credible solution for its users. And, you know, this is, this is fascinating because every other SEO agency out there is, is pushing the messaging of, you know, keywords and, and content and, you know, 
you know, regurgitating what's at the top of the results as, as what you're doing. And, and, you know, so they're all going to the left and your concept is going to the right and clearly, you know, looking at uh, some of your client examples and what you've been able to accomplish. Uh, it's absolutely uh, brilliant what you're doing. Yeah, I, I mean, I like the way you framed that. Um, we're going against the grain of the SEO community, but I would now consider myself a brand marketer rather than SEO. So we take brand, we take marketing, and we package it for search engines. And the brand and, branding and the marketing is something you should be doing as a business anyway. All we're doing is using Google to understand what needs to be done in the branding and marketing, making sure we're packaging it for Google so that Google can then understand what you've done and then represent it back to your audience through the search results. So at the end of the day, the SEO is the natural extension of the good, solid digital marketing we're doing, which is brand focused, which once again, something you should be doing anyway. Um, and then our entire approach is, comes from a, an understanding of Google, understanding the power that Google has, understanding the information that Google has, and using that against Google, as it were. So the platform itself I built nine years ago, and it could al already do this nine years ago. And we've been doing this for nine years, and we've got nine years of data, one billion data points from Google that allow us to truly understand how Google thinks. And Google thinks, in fact, in a relatively simplistic manner still. It's, it, it understands by repetition. And if we can repeat enough who you are, which audience you serve, why you're credible, and we can get the corroborative evidence surrounded around the web, we will convince Google of anything we want to. We, we can feed it with what we want, and we can get it to jump through hoops and dance to our tune, which is delightful. And there's a ton of value in that, obviously, you know, yeah. depending upon the, the industry, you know, the uh, competition for search results is just growing exponentially. And, you know, I think one of the, the more interesting thing, I, I had the opportunity to speak to founders of all types of organizations, you know, from, you know, early founders that are, are just getting concepts off the ground, maybe bootstrapped all the way up to venture capital backed uh, SaaS companies. And the number one thing that I hear over and over time and time every day is the cost of bringing traffic to my site, to my offers, to my webinar, to whatever it is that I am trying to direct traffic to continues to grow in, in cost through traditional paid methods and continues right. to deliver less results. So it sounds like this is really uh, an organic strategy to deliver results for organizations that may be uh, having those challenges in, in other ways. 100%. And uh, another interesting point, and I mean, the, the, the kicker for me is CaliCube. Now, we come from a world of SEO of Google. And my initial focus up until a few years ago was Google, 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 Google. And today, our revenue is not driven by Google traffic. Very, very, very few of our clients come through Google. What happens is because we're standing where they're looking with the right marketing materials, thanks to the insights we've got from Google, we're standing on LinkedIn, we're standing in, on YouTube, we're providing the right content to the right person at the right time, looking for the solution we can provide. That means that it's already driving business. We don't need Google. But when people come on sales calls with me, they say, well, we saw you on your podcast. We saw you on YouTube. I saw one of your articles in Forbes. But then when I searched around the topic, this red shirt and your name just kept coming up. They were using Google for validation of understanding the topic. Then once they'd got me in their brain and this red shirt, they searched my name on Google. I look like a superstar because I've managed my personal brand so well. Then they sure. search CaliCube. And the message that Google gives them about CaliCube is exactly what they've already seen on all these other platforms. So it simply so it reinforces that messaging. Yeah. And they're saying, you know, I, Google, who I trust, I use Google because I trust it, is, re is, sorry, is reiterating and confirming what I already thought. 
you are the company and you are the person that I need for my personal brand or my company brand. Fantastic. And, you know, obviously I know over the years, you know, obviously you have your book that you've, you've written, The Fundamentals of Brand Serps for Business. You've spoken everywhere and then some, all the way from Brighton SEO to PubCon, SMX, mm. all, all of the different uh, leading, um, you know, uh, engagements around the world. And uh, mm -hmm. I think, I think if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, uh, you know, all of this travel is what prompted you to start your podcast. Is that, is that uh, accurate yeah. to, to really tie it all together? And, and yeah, no, it, it is delightful. I mean, I've been working on my personal brand for quite a long time. Then I figured that just online wasn't doing it enough wasn't enough. So I then decided to go offline and bring the offline online with the podcast. So I just went from conference to conference to conference to conference. And I built my place in the SEO and digital marketing industries by being in front of people all around the world all the time, and then taking that and bringing it on, online using the podcast. So I would interview people at conferences, famous people, smart sure. people, interesting people. And it's what I call bringing the offline online. And the offline drove my career incredibly quickly because I was meeting people. And the online aspect drove Google's understanding of the growth of my career and my status in my industry because I was showing it to Google and packaging it for Google. Now Google thinks I'm a superstar in the digital marketing space, which maybe I am. <laughs> there you go. So let me ask you a question. So, so at a high level, um, you know, how is it that... Um, a lot of like, or maybe you could give a real example. Can you give an example of a specific client and how working with Calicube has, uh, you know, worked for their their business and and you know yep. using the knowledge craft to interact with what they're doing? Well, I'll give you three examples. Sure. Number one uh, is a very very famous actor who I can't name, who had some bad news. The bad news came up onto the first page. There were three or four articles about this bad news. That's online reputation management. They said, well, it's too much. And what we did is get rid of two of them because what Google wants to do is show a balanced view. And the bad news was dominating too much. And all we then needed to do was to demonstrate to Google that the bad news wasn't or shouldn't be a 35% focus on that first page for the actor. It needed to be a much smaller focus. So we reduced the weight of that bad news, which is reputation management. And reputation management comes down to proving to Google that it's giving an unrealistic or unhelpful or um, unbalanced view of that person. Got it. The okay. second case is a lawyer who looked, you know, you searched their name and it just came up with LinkedIn and a couple of other boring results and they didn't look impressive at all. We built them a knowledge panel. They've now got the knowledge panel cards with their YouTube, their Twitter, uh, who their spouse is, who their company is, and then a description in the knowledge panel and I believe their year of birth or their age. And then people also search for, which is the, the four faces you see underneath somebody's knowledge panel on the right-hand side on Google Desktop, who are famous lawyers in their field. So now when a prospect is researching which lawyer they're going to take on, they search the name and they see this amazing knowledge panel. Google is confirming that this person is a superstar in their field. Sure. They're rec Google is recommending them and saying, this person is amazing. And they're signing more or they're getting more clients who are bottom of funnel, who are thinking or choosing between multiple lawyers before signing. So that's a good example of driving business directly as, a, as, a, as an individual. And the third one is repositioning a brand, a personal brand. And we had a C or we have a CEO of a very, very big company who took that company to a multi-million dollar buyout, who then left the company and said, well, I've got my payoff from my company. I've got money. I want to become an investor and an entrepreneur. But Google and my audience see me as a CEO. So what we then did is take his personal brand across the entire internet. And we repositioned him as an entrepreneur and an investor, which meant reducing the focus on all the stuff about him as a CEO, increasing the focus on everything about him as an entrepreneur, making him stand in places where an entrepreneur would naturally stand, 
And little by little, we moved his audience's perception of him from CEO to entrepreneur and Google's perception of him from CEO to entrepreneur. And now he's getting opportunities as an entrepreneur and people perceive him to be an entrepreneur and therefore come to him with their projects, their ideas. And that is brand repositioning when you're moving forwards in your career. Three great yeah. examples of how we can help. Yeah. And let me ask you, is, is there application for this framework uh, for local SEO? Is, is there an application there? So maybe car dealers, plumbers, electricians, you know, those types of entities. There is, but generally speaking, local businesses don't put the budget that's necessary because obviously redesigning an entire digital ecosystem uh, and building an entire digital marketing strategy is midterm. It's a long term. And local, yeah. Mid to long term. And most local businesses are struggling day to day. Uh, the exceptions would be lawyers, where the, 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 the payback is relatively high and relatively quick. Uh, maybe car dealerships, I don't know. But generally speaking, local SEO or local companies are not something we're particularly relevant for, not because we can't do it, we can, but because the budget isn't there and the need is too quick, i.e. we need results in two or three months and that isn't going to happen with us. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. And you talked a little bit about the the you know, volume of, of results within the knowledge graph and, you know, the vol volume of, of entries. Can you, first off, I, I guess one question I need to ask you because uh, it's interesting. Uh, the name Calicu, uh, does, did, did that come from any specific uh, yeah. origin or just an interesting brandable name? Well, it, uh, that's an interesting question from a couple of perspectives, but the, the main perspective is, you either choose a name that says what you do, or you choose a name that's completely unique. And I went for the second one. Sure. The, there's a different strategy for a company, is if I choose to, to call my company what I do. Uh, we had a client called Backpacker Job Board. So it was a job board for backpackers. And the problem with that is you're trying to dominate a generic term in Google. So if somebody searches your name, uh, it will show all the different competitors and you somewhere in there. So you have a huge job, not only to distinguish yourself with your audience from what it is you do, i.e. all your competitors, so that you stand out in their minds as being the go-to place, but also getting Google to understand that you represent your, sorry, that the, the, the name is actually a brand name. Um, and that's hugely difficult. And I, you were talking about crowds and going left to, as opposed to right. Sure. That's the equivalent of fighting your way to the front of a huge crowd. So you can stand in front of the crowd and go, look at me, look at me, look at me, and get the crowd then to become your client. If you can win that, it's a huge game to win. But it's hugely difficult because you're fighting to get to the front of a huge, very, very, very tightly packed crowd who don't want, want to let you through. However, if you pick a name like Cali Cube, you break off from the crowd, you distinguish yourself, and then your job is to get the crowd to follow you. And you get to define sense. exactly what you do, and you get to define your own crowd. And you're already standing in front of them, but it's also a huge job. I chose the unique name. I believe in unique names. I find that a strategy I'm more comfortable with. But we also help companies who have a common name to dominate and get um, what, they, what they call the US uh, PTO, calls it acquired distinction. Sure. It's a pseudo trademark you can get by being so dominant in your market that your name represents that market. Can, can you talk a little bit about the components of the knowledge graph and that, that you're shaping through your, your strategy that you're working with these different organizations? Yeah, um, that's an interesting question as well because the knowledge graph works with entities and relationships between them. Uh, and I use the example of a family a lot. If Google can understand me, I can more easily explain to it who my mother is, who my father is, what they do, what they're expert in, because it's understood me and it will naturally understand somebody who's a relation of me. I can also explain who my children are, who my wife is. So Google will tend to understand things by groups that are linked together by close, strong, and long relationships, such as family. In a family, 
That's one thing. And we've successfully educated Google about the Buwa and Kuala family, i.e. the family tree of the cartoon characters I created. That was a fun experiment. But it demonstrated that if I could improve its understanding and its confidence and its understanding of the father, I could increase its understanding and confidence of the grandmother at the same time. So they work in tandem. And in a business perspective, that means that if we can work on the CEO, the founder, the company, and the main product all at the same time, we will have much more success because Google will understand them as a group and we can develop them as a group. And the company's credibility will help the owner's credibility. It will also help the CEO's credibility and the CEO's credibility and the founder's credibility will help the company's credibility. That makes a lot of sense. So when we can, that's what we recommend that people do is build that family, let's call it, of entities together. And what does a an engagement with Calicube look like for any of the um, individuals that are listening to this podcast and saying, wow, okay, this is different. <laughs> you know, we need to do something different. We need to get started. How would they, you know, get the ball rolling with Calicube? The... As you said earlier on, the work we do is mid to long term. So if you're coming on board to get really quick results, that isn't going to work because we're working on Google's understanding of who you are, which audience you serve, and why you're credible. So that's obviously a long-term job. We need to educate a machine. And when we're educating this machine, Google, it's like educating a child. We all have children or know people who have children or have nephews and nieces you can't expect the child to understand the first time you explain something. You have to explain it over and over again and get corroboration from multiple trusted sources. It's the same with Google. Google is a child. You need to educate it and make it learn to love you. And that's what we do. And we do that by proving it across the entire internet where Google is watching. And Google, the child, is watching you every step of the way. And if you can prove it by walking the walk, day in, day out, day in, day out for a year, Google will love you and it will love you to death. I so, love it. And we're, you know, on, on, obviously we'll leave links in the show notes so that people can, can get in touch, but mm -hmm. that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, I mean, work with us for a year and we will make Google love you. Simple as that. Perfect. And I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you with all of the uh, background that you have and uh, seeing what's going on with uh, Google's latest uh, update, which seems to be one of the, the more massive <laughs> updates that we've seen over the years. Can, can you give us your perspective on, uh, on what's going on for people that might be listening to the podcast? Yeah, well, we don't focus on the traditional algorithms, which is what everybody's getting terribly upset about right now. And Google have said, this is going to be a massive change. Hold on to your seats, I think they said. And they had to try and roll that back because it scared everybody. Um, what is happening is that they are integrating knowledge into their algorithms much more tightly. They've been doing it for the last year and a half, and we've been tracking that. So the, um, the updates haven't rolled out fully yet. But what we're seeing right in the middle of the traditional SEO updates that's, that are happening. It's a huge update in the knowledge graph. I said to you just before the show, yesterday, literally sure. yesterday, the size of the knowledge graph increased by one and a half percent in one day. That's wow. huge. It's, it's increased by, you know, it's, sorry, it's increased um, one and a half percent. If you take that from 50 billion entities, it's added three billion entities overnight. That's a huge, huge, huge change. So what we're now seeing is that the traditional SEO updates are now working in tandem with the knowledge graph updates. That makes the knowledge graph the most important foundational building stone for your entire search and even digital marketing strategy. Because I'm going to reiterate something that I mentioned earlier on. All of these machines work the same. If it's Amazon, Apple, Bing, Microsoft, uh, chat gpt google they all learn by digesting information and trying to turn it into a knowledge graph so if you can win the trick on google you will win the trick on all of these machines and you get self-determination in how these machines understand you how they represent you 
and you have a shield and security for the future. Self-determination moving into a world where generative AI is controlling search and digital in general. Self-determination, you can't put a price on that. That's fantastic. Well, like I said, I really appreciate your taking the time out today to uh, bring our, our software spotlight uh, listeners and community up to date on Knowledge Graph and uh, everything Ooh. going on over there at Brand Syrup. And, and uh, you reminded me of something, which is obviously this is all about software. And I'd just like to point out sure. that CaliCube Pro is a software with a billion data points. And I built it with my own little hands nine years ago, and we're still building, building it today. So everything sure. that I've got in my brain, everything I know, everything I've understood about how to manipulate Google, how to educate Google, how to get Google on your side, how to make you Google famous so that you attract the right people and get the, 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 the conversions and the engagement that you need, all of that is in this machine, which is basically a huge representation of what I've got in my brain. And I don't think there are any other software companies, at least in our field, who can come close to that. And and I guess you know, that, that brings up one last question. Obviously you like to refer to yourself as the brand syrup guy, but Calicube is your, your organization. And at a high level, it sounds like Calicube is both a tool that some organizations are using, but I think what you're, you're offering at Calicube is you are actually um, using the tool that you built uh, hmm. for your clients. Is that, that accurate? Exactly. Um, so if you want to get the benefits of CaliCube Pro, the tool, a billion data points that, that will push your brand to exactly the right places for your audience with the right content at the right time in the right priority, and also get Google to understand it so it represents you as a superstar within your industry, we're the ones who can offer the service. The number of agencies who we allow to use CaliCube Pro is very, very limited. So we have a unique machine, and if you want to work with us or with a, an agency who uses the platform, um, you know, you, you, yeah, work with the best because we've got the machine and nobody else does. I mean, I, I hate to say it sounds very pretentious, but you don't have a choice. Sorry. I, I love it. No, that, that, that sounds horrible. That, I just realized how no, horrible that sounds. No, no <laughs> worries. But no, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, it would almost be as if you were going to Google and say, Hey, Google, handle our, our advertising and marketing. You know, obviously you guys develop the tool. You've hmm. licensed some agencies to use the tool, but what, what's better than having having you use the tool yourself and, and get the results that people need? 100%. Thank you very much. Very, you said it much very, more nicely than I did. Uh, no, it's okay. It's okay. Um, so I, I want to share that coming up on our next episode of the Software Spotlight, um, we're actually going to be breaking some some groundbreaking research on AI uh, for the first time from an individual that, quite honestly, you will not find a single word about this researcher online anywhere. Uh, his name is Pratik Thantarate. Uh, he's a cybersecurity researcher, uh, very high level. He's a Google Scholar. And he, in his research, has explored the intersection of AI, blockchain and data privacy. Uh, this research will be uh, revealed for the first time on Software Spotlight and uh, quite honestly, uh, you know, should be very, very interesting to anyone in the field of AI. His research uh, work includes developing Zero Trust Block, a blockchain framework for secure health data management and genetic SecOps, which is, uses genetic algorithms for automated security testing. Pratik's research aims to address key challenges around data privacy and security in the era of generative AI. So be sure to tune in for our next episode, and I think that'll be very interesting. And uh, be sure to visit our website, softwareoasis.com, to access our free weekly software newsletter and sign up for our upcoming 2024 software webinar series, which happens every week right here. And uh, just to let everybody know, uh, if, if you enjoyed our episode today, coming up uh, on May 8th, um, Jason will be joining us for our webinar, Unlocking Growth Through Lead Generation, which 
always proves to be one of our, our most exciting and well-attended webinars. This will be the second time we've run this webinar as we had so much interest on the topic of online lead generation. And uh, we'll have a whole new panel of, of guests on, on this lead generation uh, webinar. And uh, Jason, we're really looking forward to having you on that. And thank you for joining us on the Software Spotlight this week. Thank you so much, Michael. That was an absolute delight.